Hi, my name is Dee Dee Chang, your host. In this workshop episode of Audio Builder TV, we will look back to the March of 2016 workshop, Mike Pre's A to Z. In this incredible talk, Peter Gaskell gave us the history of the microphone preamp. Peter is an educator and an electronics designer. He works as a research and development engineer for the University of Michigan. When he gets time away from designing self-driving cars and robots, he designs audio electronics. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and sign up for a mailing list at audiobuildersworkshop.com. <laughs> Audio Builders. Audio Builders Workshop is a work group for the Boston chapter of the Audio Engineering Society. I started in analog electronics. I was working in a, a quantum optics lab at the University of Oregon. I was designing locking amplifiers and RF amplifiers and stuff to uh, control the, the rubidium atoms with lasers. It was a lot of fun. Um, I got, so, I, yeah, my, my brother was doing audio at the time, and so we built, um, I got the audio bug, and that's actually the first 312 card we built because I found a whole bunch of old analog devices, potted modules, so we just started uh, playing around with what we could do with them. Uh, I went to get my graduate degree at McGill, and I worked in a lot of nanoelectronics, so I was with a group that was building uh, field effect transistors with 2D materials, and I did a lot of electron beam lithography and scanning electron microscopy. Uh, Eric and I also were looking at applications of graphene for other things, so we, we designed and produced uh, graphene oxide uh, microphones and speakers, and we're actually working with some people right now to sort of get that going as a business. I, I don't know if it's going to work, but it's an interesting <laughs> idea. Um, we, uh, while we were at McGill, we founded uh, GKL, and I do all of the circuit layout and design. Uh, we have a few products, including a, a MAO5 five-channel remote-controlled mic pre that is huge and crazy and uh, was very difficult to get working. And uh, a much nicer uh, MOPEC we'll talk about later. Uh, but right now, I'm at the University of Michigan, and I work in robotics, and I work with people who are doing Ford self-driving cars, and Mabel, the fastest running robot on two legs. So, I just saw that at the Museum of Science last night. Yeah. <laughs> nice. It is an impressive robot. OK, uh, next slide. So um, let's start with the requirements for mic pre circuits, OK? The mic pre outputs a very small voltage, usually millivolts. OK, you want to amplify that significantly to several volts. So that's the main problem. So your gain needs to be about 60 dB or 1,000 times or more, uh, and you usually want that variable. Uh, the frequency response is obviously going to have to be in the audio range because we don't necessarily need to amplify things that are in the megahertz, and we don't necessarily need to. Uh, we don't want it to be bandwidth limited, so we can't hear all the, all the sound. The input impedance needs to be matched to the mic being used, so different mics have different output impedances. Ribbon mics tend to have, I think, higher output impedances. Uh, uh, electrets have very low output impedances because they have an amplifier after them. Uh, dynamic mics have a very complicated output impedance. Um, the noise, you want to be very, very low. Oh, so the output impedance of the mic, you need to be very low because you need to drive a cable. The cable has a lot of capacitance, and so that can provide a lot of problems if your output impedance is high um, because you'll filter it. Uh, the noise needs to be very low, a few nanovolts per root hertz. And you need to reject interference from environmental noise. Uh, you need to have high common mode rejection. So those are the basic requirements for a microphone preamplifier. So let's see the history of how we got to circuits that could do that. Next slide. So we start over 100 years ago with the invention of the vacuum triode. Um, feedback, actually, the basics of op amp wasn't really uh, mathematically defined until 1927. And the op amp itself. The idea of the op amp wasn't really out there until 1940 when they were using them first to build anti-aircraft guns. <laughs> they started making tube op amps, which is the things on the end, this, this circuit, uh, in the late 40, or the early 40s. And, um, and that was really the game at the time for, and would be for like 10 more years or more. The first transistor wasn't invented until 1947. It was a tiny piece of germanium crystal with some plastic. It looked like that, uh, not very impressive. But rapidly, they were able to make much, much better transistors out of germanium. Uh, you can see the idea behind this, uh, the germanium transistor and why we call it a semiconductor sandwich. It's literally a tiny sliver of p-type or n-type material sandwiched between two different other types of material. 
it's grown from a liquid and doped in the middle, and then you attach the tiny little wires to it. Um, that was not the best way to do things, and so one of the probably most important advances in semiconductor electronics was the idea that you could diffuse dopants into the material, so you could define uh, all sorts of different structures based on starting single crystal. And so with that, they were able to make the first silicon BJT in 1954. Next slide. Okay, so the early micro topologies usually follow this, follow this basic concept because in the early days, gain was hard to come by. So you have different stages with fixed gain, sometimes three or four stages, and then in between those stages, you want to reduce the level because you want to gain control. So you get all your gain at the front end and then you reduce it after the fact. And you transform or couple the input and the output. And that's what allows you to get the common mode rejection. And you can also get some voltage gain because transformers inherently can give you voltage gain if their windings are set up right. Next slide. So if we look at an early tube mic pre from the 1928, you can see there's actually four stages, right? And then there's no, uh, on this one actually there's no volume control. But so each stage with a different output impedance is giving a different amount of gain. So each stage you're getting more gain. At the end, you've got enough gain. You can't get all the gain. You couldn't at this time get all the gain with one stage. So you had to make multiple stage amplifiers. Next slide. Then when they started using transistors, they had to use the same principle. So in this, you see a transformer coupled input. You see the same thing, common collector uh, amplifiers. Uh, common emitter amplifier, sorry, uh, with different gains. And then you have a potentiometer to reduce the volume level. So there's no actually, there's only fixed gain and you're not, you're not increasing the volume. There's no feedback that controls the gain of the circuit. This is a 1961 germanium transistor amplifier. Next slide. Okay. So at this point, we've had tubes and we've had germanium transistors. But the big thing that came along was the silicon transistor and the ability to make it into an integrated circuit. Okay, so the, the single probably most important thing in silicon technology is the ability to use silicon oxide to grow on the wafer and define different features. And so they were able to use this to define different areas and then diffuse different types of materials to make transistors. You can see the silicon is a single crystal silicon. The oxide is an amorphous. It's glass. It's the same thing, all these things. But that glass is very, very stable. And unlike the oxide that forms on germanium, it's not water soluble. So silicon transistors did not have the same leakage problems that germanium transistors have. And they didn't, the processing became a lot easier. So through the 50s and the 60s, um, Fairchild, which is probably the most important semiconductor company ever, was founded. Uh, the IC was invented by TI in a poor attempt and by Fairchild in a much better attempt. Um, the first germanium op amps, like actual op amps, started showing up in the 1958. Uh, the planar transistor, which is one of the most important transistor out there, uh, the development of transistors, was developed in 1959, and then we saw very quickly the first silicon op-amps. Uh, 1961 was that amplifier I just showed you, that germanium amplifier. And then, uh, let's see, 1961 also when Neve was founded. So you probably recognize the name. Uh, in 1962, we started seeing the modular silicon op-amps. These are those potted modules that look like that on the end, uh, and like the API 2520 and like the Jensen 990, those style of op-amps really showed up in about 62. Next slide. So those style of op amps lead to a different sort of topology for a mic amplifier. You have an op amp which has a feedback loop. And now you can get gain by just changing that feedback loop. So you have a transformer into the op amp. Op amp is your only gain stage. There's a feedback loop around the whole thing. And then the gain is set by the ratio of the two resistors like we talked about before. You also tend to transformer balance the output. Um, that's a choice 
uh, most, most things did that. They had transforms on the input, transforms on the output for good common mode rejection. Uh, next slide. So if we look at the feedback op amp. This is the classic example, the API 312. You can see there's an op amp, there's a feedback resistor, and then this gain trim resistor, this is where you stick your other potentiometer to tune that gain so you can change the feedback. And you change the feedback loop, change the gain of the op amp. Really simple mic pre, really famous mic pre. I think everybody knows about this. Uh, next one. So other uh, mics use the exact same principle. This is the Hardy M1. Uses the Jensen 990 modular. It's very similar. You have the 990 op amp. It has a feedback loop here. And then you you're setting the gain with the resistance on the top. Simple single op amp, single resistance feedback loop changes the gain. Uh, next slide. OK, so one of the problems with this uh, topology, uh, and take it or leave it, is that with an op amp with a feedback loop, you have a defined gain bandwidth. That is, you have, a, depending on how much gain you use, you get less bandwidth. The, the ratio, the, they're always constant, the gain product, the gain in the bandwidth. So for these op amps, the trick was to make the op amp fast enough that the the frequency response was defined for all gains basically by the frequency response of the transformer. Because otherwise, as you increase the gain, you actually get less frequency. Your bandwidth shrinks. So this is measurements for the API. You can see at the top gain, it does shrink a little bit. And this is starting to look like a uh, multiple pull roll off. And the Hardy M1 also does the same thing. Uh, next slide. So. Uh, the solution to this, uh, or one solution to this, using this topology, is to do the twin uh, op amp. So you, instead of having all the gain with one stage, now you split it between two stages, and you have less of a problem because you're not reducing your bandwidth so much because you're using lower gains, your bandwidth is wider. The uh, Jensen twin servo does the same thing. You have two op amps, they both have feedback loops, and the gain is controlled by a dual ganged two potentiometers that are controlled by one knob. OK? Next slide. So that was the era of modular discrete stuff. When you get, get into the 60s and the development of the integrated circuit, we can start looking at you know, what's inside those tiny little chips that we sort of see. They're black boxes. They don't, you don't really understand. But it's basically the same thing. It's just done on, in a single wafer of silicon. And it's pretty impressive how they did that. So the first IC op amps, really, uh, were designed by this guy, Bob Widler, who is a god. He's famous. He's amazing. Um, and uh, this is actually the first design that was a commercial op amp design. You can see all of the, I, I, I didn't really, I'll explain what things are later, but uh, there's transistors, there's resistors, there's pads. This fits in a tiny little package with little tiny gold wires bonded to the outside that you can stick in your circuit. About the same time, analog devices started selling modules. That one's the 118. I think, I, Eric, we, I think we have like a bunch of those somewhere. <laughs> um, and uh, then the idea of the semiconductor processing technique uh, in 1966, dielectric isolation, which is probably the most important uh, processing technique for analog electronics on integrated circuits, was invented. Um, the API was founded in 67. Uh, 68, the very famous UA741 was made. The, we showed the schematic, and I'll talk about that. I'll show you the, the die later. And uh, 68 is the earliest reference I've found to a current feedback instrumentation amp. I'll talk about those later. Just putting, I, these are all in order of time, so uh, just so I don't have to go back and forth. Uh, 68, the 2520 came out, and uh, 69, the, the Neve 1063 came out. So next slide. So early analog ICs. How do you fit all those transistors and all those diodes and all those resistors on a tiny bit of silicon? Well, one of the transistors are tiny. They're very small. They don't need to be big. In fact, you, you want them small because you get better performance usually when they're smaller uh, for certain things, higher gain. Uh, the harder things to fit on an IC when they're small are things like capacitors and resistors because they're huge compared to the rest of the circuit. 
you can see this tiny 10 puff capacitor that's in the circuit takes up almost all of the die. It's huge. A resistor, this 10, this uh, 32K or something, resistance is, uh, you can't really see here, but it's this serpentine structure that's winding over and over and over and over and over again just to get that resistance because they really had no way of making very small uh, resistors that were very accurate. The only way, and this is one of Bob Widler's big contributions, uh, was to design what's called a pinch resistor. And you're able to get a much larger resistance in a much smaller space. The problem with the pinch resistor is it's very difficult to control. So in the early days, you had very little control over things like the resistance of resistors in your package. You had very little control. Uh, uh, things tended to be huge. Things that you needed to make stability happen tended to be very large. And so the performance suffered um, because you couldn't really get a complicated circuit in the small space. So let's look at the next slide. Um, the other issue with the planar the early analog transistors was that the NPN transistors they were able to make and the PNP transistors they were able to make are completely different structures and they're not complementary. So you get different performance when you make a PNP next to an NPN and you can't have this nice balanced complementary performance that you get with a discrete amplifier where you can select which MPN you're using and which PNP you're using so you get the same sort of performance, the same sort of gain. So PNPs in this process had to be made in a different way to get high enough gain out of them. And they weren't complementary to NPNs. So in the early days, and most ICs now make analog ICs, or those cheap ones, may still use this process and they're different. And so they had to do a lot of things, a lot of extra circuit design to get around this problem. Next slide. So uh, in 1971, the first current feedback instrumentation amplifier was done as an integrated circuit from ADI. It's a really interesting paper. Uh, in 1972, the complementary process, this is the first process that allowed them to make PNPs and NPNs the same on a single silicon wafer. Uh, that was until the 70s. In 1975, the 5534 that everybody knows and loves came out. And it's interesting, that's actually not a complementary process. They, they don't, the NPNs and the PNPs on that chip are not the same, but still great performance. And the reason why it has great performance is because of all the little tricks the analog designer were able to do to match the performance of the NPNs and the PNPs by adding extra circuitry around it. So it looks really complicated, but it's really just so that it behaves like a simpler circuit. Uh, 1975, SSM was founded. They're very important. Uh, they were the first people to make integrated circuit mic amps. They were specially mic amps. They were bought by ADI. They're now uh, SSM products. They're now analog devices products. Um, in, let's see, 75, uh, analog devices started laser trimming their resistors. And this was key. They started using thin film resistors similar to what you see in chips. And then to get the performance, to get the matching, instead of these uh, not capable of getting good performance, uh, instead of resistors that were hard to control the resistance of, they would, they would laser trim them after the fact to get good matching. So all the highest performance analog circuits today use laser trimming of the resistors. Um, let's see. The uh, 990 modular op amp came out in 1980. Uh, 82, George Massenberg founded GML. I have to say that because George was a great help in, uh, in our stuff. And he came out with the 8304 mic pre and 83. I'm just sort of giving some context, some time context to the, these events. Uh, next slide. So we can look at it at 5534 and what they have to do to get the performance to be complementary, right? You have all sorts of extra circuitry all sorts of extra transistors that perform functions to linearize different uh, parts of the circuit so that they perform more like uh, the simple op amp, which is people are trying to go for. So let's look at the next one. So this is like a simple discrete op amp, right? Here you're able to have transistors Q6 and Q3, which are PNP and NPN, but because you're able to select them, they have similar performance. You're able to have Q4 and Q5 be very similar because you're able to select them and have similar performance. But you go back to the other slide. 
is actually a similar circuit, but you have all these extra transistors that are there in the process to make sure that you can get the performance of the complementary performance out of it. So um, really, the 5534 is an amazingly engineered chip, and it's a great chip. It has lots of extra stuff. And so when you look at a circuit and you're like, oh my god, that's so complicated. There's so much stuff going on there. Really, it's just stuff that's getting it to work like the simple circuit in the next slide. This one, which is a 2510. Uh, we actually took this one apart, depotted it, and figured out the circuit. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Chip all that stuff off. And it's a really simple circuit, right? You have a, you have a long tail pair, the current source. These are, you can go look at a textbook, and, and, and the, this will be there, and that'll be there, and show you how to analyze it. Then you have like another current source and a single transistor amplifier. You have a VBE multiplier circuit. That's standard, standard circuit. And then you have a class AB output state. You can go and get a textbook, and every single circuit in this, you turn to a page, and there'll be exactly how to analyze that circuit and what, what it does. And the in, input voltages, the output voltages, and the currents, and everything. It's a very simple circuit to analyze. Uh, and high performance. Only eight transistors, 12 resistors, and three capacitors. But you couldn't just put this on an integrated circuit because those BJTs would not be the same. You know, you'd not get the same performance. You'd have to do a lot of extra stuff to get it to perform the same. Next slide. OK, so the big processing advance of dielectric isolation, this is what I, was, I wanted to talk about a lot. Very few uh, analog chips still, still use actual di dielectric isolation. Uh, that corp is one of the big companies that is really pushing that technology for their audio equipment, their audio chips. And the reason why the traditional way to do it is to have these NP junctions, these reverse bias junctions that are supposed to carry no current. The problem is there's leakage. So you have two devices, and they're different. They're structured completely differently because of they're not complementary. But you still get reverse, you have a reverse bias on this diode, this junction, diode junction. And there's leakage between the two. So the crosstalk is poor. So you don't really get the same performance. You have to have things spread out a little bit. Uh, you don't get as many transistors in the same area. And the big problem is that the transistors themselves are not complementary. They don't look the same. They're, they're not mirror images of each other. In a dielectric isolation, you're actually able to grow an oxide, silicon glass, that's, a, that's, a, that's an insulator. And all the transistors are electrically isolated completely from each other. And you're able to make them exactly the same. So the NPN and the PNP look the same. And the performance is similar. So the next slide. OK. So this would be an advanced analog IC. You can see it's starting to look really complicated. But this uses junction isolation to isolate the transistors. They're able to get a really good input stage by having a lot of transistors parallel transistors. You're starting to see thin film resistances, so they're not using diffusion resistors anymore. They're using actual deposited film to get the resistors, so they're higher performance. And you're also laser trimming them, so you can tune the resistance of the chip as you know when you're manufacturing it. So when you actually get it in that package, it's already trimmed. It's as the highest performance you can get. You don't have to match things or anything like that. So next slide. OK, so the IC mic amp is what the CP5 uses, and a lot of basically everyone uses nowadays if they're not trying to do a, a uh, you know, vintage build or something. So the, the first one really was the SSM 2011 that came out in 83. Um, there were hybrid modules that is discrete uh, circuitry and integrated circuitry in the same module in 84. Uh, in 89, the SSM 2017 came out that was uh, analog, well, it was analog devices at the time, actually. Uh, and uh, that one is very similar to the INA217, which you might see. Um, in 1993, that corp founded. 2000, TI introduced the INA163. That's what the GRACE uses. Uh, 2002, TI introduced the INA217. That's basically a copy, second source for the SSM 2017. And then in 2001, that started introducing its mic pre-chips the 1510 and the 1512 in 2001 and 2004. 
The, that 1510 and the 1512 are a dielectric isolation process. They use the complementary NPN, PNP transistors, and they use what's called current feedback amplifiers. So let's look at the next slide. So the uh, traditional instrumentation amp, right, this is a transformerless amplifier, so you have two off amps that are buffering the signal. And if you look, if you do the analysis on this, uh, you, you get the, the single RG changes the gain of the circuit. What's great about this circuit, though, is that the first stage, the first two amplifiers, they have uh, a differential gain that's given by that equation. But their common mode gain is only one. That is, the same voltage appearing at the inputs, if it's the exact same voltage, the gain will only be one for the first stage. And then the second stage, because it's a differential amplifier, it will actually, the gain will be like minus 40 dB, or minus 80 dB if it's well matched, right? So you're not amplifying any of the common mode signals. In fact, you're attenuating common mode signals while amplifying the differential signals. It's a very important thing. And this is the circuit that the baby pre uses. It's really easy to analyze. The, all the IC mic amps use the very similar circuit. If you look at the data sheet, it actually looks like the first one. It actually looks like the three op amp instrumentation amp. They're doing something different, though, because what they're doing is they're, instead of using voltage feedback, RF and RG, to provide a voltage to the inverting terminals, they're using a technique called current feedback to, different, to bias these transistors differently. The advantage of that is that the bandwidth doesn't change with gain. So all the IC mic amps, every single one of them, uses a topology that's similar to the second uh, picture here, okay? Let's look at the next slide. You, you can see this is what happens. So with the voltage, you have the same thing we saw with a single op amp. As you increase the gain, the bandwidth narrows, right? You have a gain bandwidth product. With the current feedback amplifier, that's not true. If you increase the gain, the bandwidth stays the same. And that's an, an, at, very advantageous for a mic amp where you don't want to change the sound when you're adding gain. So let's look at the next slide. OK. So the, uh, this is actually a sort of famous design that's out there on the internet uh, from 1984. They did this in a module. This is a little potted module you can get. Uh, it's a hybrid, so it's a current feedback amplifier. And you can tell, you can look at all these circuits, you can tell you have a resistor going back to the emitters of the input pair. These used a matched, super matched pair that you can't get anymore. It's unfortunate and uh, 5532s for the amplifier. Let's look at the next slide. So you have, you can see on this die, on this chip, you actually have the integrated circuits on there, right, with tiny little wires bonding them to the rest of the circuit, but then you're able to use capacitors that are normal sized. <laughs> I mean, normal sized, they're still small, but they're, you know, they're not micro. Um, and you're able to use laser trim resistor film. So you put the resistors down, there's a, uh, with a film and actually cut into them so that they're exactly the right resistance that you want. It's too bad more people aren't able to do this. I think it's, a very ex it's still an expensive process to make something like this. But we're, get we're able to do something very similar to this with, with, uh, with a circuit board now um, that was harder to do back then because the availability of these small components. Let's look at the next slide. Okay, so this is sort of the... the uh, top of the line hybrid of this same style. So this is the SSL 9000 uh, mic pre circuit. Apparently, it's very similar. You can see here you have the different the the input stage feeding back to the emitters of the input transistors. These are MA212s. They don't make that part anymore, but they do make one called the MAT12, which is very similar. I think it still costs like twenty five dollars, but you can get free samples if you ask. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, in, in this one, they do a lot of extra stuff that's going on, but the basic circuit is the same. You have the input amplifiers with the current feedback to the input pair, and then you have some amplifiers in the output that are running a, di that are a, a, a difference amplifier on the output. And this is using two difference amplifiers instead of one, but it's basically the same stuff. You can sort of see that really simple schematic in this if you look hard enough. You can train your eye to, to, to see these things. You know, I, I never get bogged down in the details of like what this resistor or that resistor is. You sort of start seeing that you know, things just simplify out and the, it's just the simpler one. This is just sort of a more complicated version. It's easier to just start with the simple one and then add on later. So let's look at the next slide. Okay, so the first IC mic pre was this SSM 2011. 
Uh, this is not the actual schematic. This is you know, a sort of reference schematic. But it's basically the same idea. You have an input pair, you have an output, and you have two amplifiers that are now controlling this current for the feedback loop. Um, this sort of totem pole topology is a little bit different than what's used now, uh, but it, it's fundamentally the same idea. There's a really good paper by Derek Bowers, from Analog Devices, that really describes this, this, this topology and the AMP01, which is a chip that's still available today. Uh, next slide. So the modern IC mic amp, like that 1512, uh, same thing. So we have two amplifiers that are providing current feedback into the emitters and then a difference amplifier on the output. Okay, next slide. And it's really easy to use this amplifier. You don't have to do much at all. You drop it in the circuit, you add some resistance for the gain loop. Here's the connection to the resistor. You add some, some fundamental easy circuits on the front. So you have a pad that switches in the impedance. You have a polarity to switch from that to that side. You know, you have a phantom that adds phantom voltage through some current limiting resistors. You have a diode bridge to protect the circuit if it blows up. Very, very simple, easy to implement. This is the schematic for the CP5. Okay, so <laughs> that's my thought. That's how we got from tubes to the CP5. I don't know how long did I take. Sort of talked for a while. All right, so that's Bob Widler. He's awesome. Uh, smoking on the job. <laughs> Any questions? Um, when you were talking about the, the IC on band, or like you were comparing the N5534 to the ATI 520. Yeah, well, the, yeah. Um, so being that the 5534 has more components to make a simple circuit, does that mean that, does that affect the efficiency of the circuit? Um, the efficiency. So it's probably far more efficient than the API circuit. Um, in terms of its quiescent current is a lot lower, so it's going to produce a lot less heat. Its power output drive capability is lower than the 2520, because the 2520 has some huge power output transistors. Um, and in order to get the frequency response with those huge output transistors, they need a lot of quiescent current. So that gets really hot. Um, if you want to add an output stage, though, you can you know, add two power transistors after uh, you know, 5534 and make a really good, you know, discrete style transistor, you know, th with the same sort of similar characteristic. Because um, most of the characteristics from the 2520 probably comes from its output. And that increases the frequency response. That inc no, well, that would not, because the frequency response would probably still be set by the loop of the first amp. Okay. But it would increase the power, like the, the current drive of the amp amplifier. It, it might reduce the frequency response if the output stage couldn't keep up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the GML design. The GML, you say, is what kind of design? Oh, uh, it's a current feedback uh, instrumentation amplifier. It's actually a cascode input stage. Um, George, apparently, as he told me, designed it because he wanted a stage that could effectively remove phantom voltage without capacitively coupling the amplifier, and he wasn't able to accomplish that. As far as he knows, no one has uh, a, a good, solid design that is able to do that. So if you're interested in playing around with a circuit that could be useful, it would be a DC-coupled microphone amplifier uh, that could remove the phantom voltage so you didn't have to remove it with capacitors. Yeah. And that actually used the LM394 as the input originally. And now that you can't get that, I think he's using the SSM, uh, the, the, the MAT12, basically. Yeah. Just as a, a point of reference about that corporation, that was the semiconductor division of DBX years and years ago. Yep. Which is a you know local company right here in Newton. Oh yeah, they're here. And, they're awesome. Um, you know, they're down in Marlboro now. They're a great company. Yeah, their fab is in California, but they're they're all here. And they have if you go to their website, if you want to learn about stuff, go to their website and read their application notes because they're they're a company that's specifically uh, for audio uh, electronics. Like that's their whole game. And so their, their, their tech notes, their, their data sheets, their papers that they present to AES every year, they have a lot of very good information. Uh, and it's not written to the super high technical level. They're that very entertaining. They're very entertaining. They're good writers. Yeah. 
Uh, so I would definitely go to their website and look at all of their stuff. Um, it's been an excellent reference for me. Uh, I look at their stuff all the time. They're yeah. doing a lot of automotive algorithms these days, so when you go to their website, don't be discouraged that it looks like they're doing a lot of software and think that they are <laughs> You have to dig to find the audio. Oh, then you just click on the ICs. They, yeah. they, have, they have three sections. So they do television, DBX licensing, or uh, they do a lot of different stuff. But yeah, their IC division is, is great, and they make good chips. Uh, because they use the best process technology they can. And uh, in fact, so their fab uh, in Milpitas was was originally a uh, fab that was making you know military grade circuits for for uh, I don't I don't even know what because it's probably classified. Um, <laughs> but right, so very few companies like saw value in using dielectric isolation and thin films to do analog electronics over you know, you know precision for for consumer electronics. These are the kinds of processes that you would only see in like a high-end military stuff. So they, uh, they grabbed that fab and they kept, kept it going and they're able to make really good stuff. The, pre the I think some people are building tomorrow, um, four, five, six people are building tomorrow, but the, um, that you're, that's the baby pre. That's the baby pre. What? What chip is in there? Okay, so the baby pre is a little bit different um, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but the baby pre uses uh, 5532s in an instrumentation amplifier uh, setup, and uh, it's a choice that we made uh, to not use an IC mic pre. Uh, so you can sort of see what's going on, and you can do the analysis. You can understand why the circuit works the way it does, uh, because it's sort of a textbook uh, example of a circuit. You can you can you know do really easily calculate what the gain it should be if the resistances are this or that. Um, so that's a choice we make. It still sounds great. Uh, it's not, you know, the performance is not quite up there with an IC mic amp where they're really uh, tuning the performance of everything so that, you know, it, it's, it, we'll, we'll show later the, the performance difference. It, it, we, we clearly make that case later. Yeah. Anything else? Where can I get that picture on the left? <laughs> <laughs> Just Google Bob Woodler. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some guy on the internet made this. I, I take no credit for this. I, unfortunately, I didn't have references on my slides. If you really want to know where anything's from, I can, I can find it for you and, and tell you. Yeah. I'll just add a little uh, background on SSM. You mentioned SSM was a chip manufacturer uh, who made mic preamps. Uh, they actually existed before they made their first mic preamp, before yep. they were able to do that. They made a number of uh, synthesizer chips, voltage-controlled amps, voltage-controlled oscillators. And without those chips, uh, I wouldn't have been able to buy my first Prophet 5 synthesizer. <laughs> that was one of the first polyphonic synthesizers that was based around SSM chips. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.